Welcome to the Capital Spotlight. Today we have David Valger with DVO Real Estate. Welcome. Thank you, Rob. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. So uh, diving right in, we're talking about obviously deal making, joint ventures. And so can you talk a little bit more about what your business does from a originating, structuring and evaluating joint venture perspective? Sure. We're an investor in the multifamily asset class in the U.S., uh, we invest both in value add acquisitions and in ground up development projects. We do so through two different structures, um, through a limited uh, partner structure, an LP structure we call gap equity, which really is a joint venture structure with some preference to us to a 10 IRR. And then um, with a higher um, carrot interest or participation above our 15% promote hurdle to the local partner, kind of a, a way to incentivize local partners to bring us triples and home runs, um, to do so through one, them taking a little more risk up front, but two, uh, really keeping a bigger part of the uh, value that they've created throughout the project. <clears throat> and then the second way we invest is through GP co-investment, meaning we invest not as a limited partner or a majority investor, but as a majority investor within their general partner structure. Um, <clears throat> and there we're usually 50 to 80% of the equity um, and uh, kind of a, a always parry pursue to the sponsor, but kind of a more unique way uh, for us to avail our investors of opportunities in all multifamily uh, deals in general. That sounds good. So let's start with the gap equity, as you call it, because I think that's a more unique structure uh, that you don't see as often. So you, you mentioned the 10% IRR hurdle, and then you also mentioned a 15% IRR hurdle. So what's the, the tiers and the promotes that along the way? So uh, in, in a typical uh, gap equity transaction, our local partner um, calls us in and says, look, I'm looking for equity on this deal. I believe it's a, a unique opportunity to make a really a strong return, um, whether it's a combination of cash flow and uh, or terminal value or both. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there in a typical transaction, the sponsor will put up 20% of the equity. We will be there with 80% of the equity. Um, in the cash flow period of the property, we're usually parry pursue to a five or 6% return, meaning there's no preference. Uh, we're both getting pro rata returns based on the capital we contributed. Um, then in a uh, capital event waterfall, meaning either a post refinance or a sale of the property, we're able to um, uh, have a uh, preference, uh, meaning that until we make our money back and a 10% return annualized on the money we invested, the local partner's equity and any cash flow they received to, to date would be subordinated to that 10% IRR. Then there's a negotiation of what happens, frankly, between 10 and 15. And, um, you know, sometimes um, uh, we go parry pursue. Sometimes um, uh, at 13 or 14, the local partner will catch up to whatever, where, whatever level we are in, usually 13 or 14, because we'll get there first. Um, but 15 is the promote number, meaning when we get to a 15 IRR, when DBO achieves a 15% IRR in a transaction, our local partner will get 100% of the cash to catch up to the same 15% IRR on their investment. And once we're both at that 15% level um, is when they start to receive a promote or a carrot interest, the compensation for their doing all the work and bringing us the deal in the first place. And that promote usually is um, giving them anywhere between 50% and 65% of the remaining cash flow. Said in other ways, their um, current interest over 15 is anywhere between um, 30 and um, 50%. Yeah, that's very well explained. So that you know, typically you'd see an 8% preferred or a 10% preferred and then just a straight 20 or 30% split above that. Yeah, I think 2025 is more standard. I have seen 30. I don't think that's market, but I have seen it from private, you know, when 
investors are trying to get a private, uh, a sponsor is trying to get a private investor in, not institutional. And um, what's different when they say there's an 8% or a 10% or a 9% pref, it usually means that um, the promote hurdle is eight, nine, or 10, right? but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's true preference. In other words, uh, in those transactions that are powered pursue standard joint venture transactions, the investor and the sponsor are both making uh, return until they get to the preferred hurdle, powered pursue or um, re- you know, directly related, correlated to uh, their contribution of equity. And if let's say that the sponsor put in 10% and the investor put in 90%, then they're going to split that cash flow 90-10 until that uh, promote hurdle kicks in. And once the promote hurdle kicks in, then, um, sorry, and once the promote hurdle kicks in, then you're going to get some sort of that 20% or 25 or 30, whatever it is. Uh, but 30 is rare. It's usually reserved for the private deals and not on the institutional side. Whereas our goal is to allow sponsor to take a look at a deal that we may offer them and a more standard joint venture investor would offer them and recognize that if they have the outcome they are looking for, the outcome that they're projecting, that using our waterfall, they will make one and a half to two times the promote that they would make in a more standard 90-10 deal. Um, Meaning that, you know, uh, we're leaving them with more of the upside that they've created in our deal structure. I think that's a really good distinction that maybe some people miss as far as the actual senior subordinate structure where a GP is actually going to put their money subordinate to yours and wait until you've actually re- received your 10% before they really receive anything, right? Or at least they're at least they're party pursue up to that five or 6% threshold. So I think many ways that your structure really incentivizes a sponsor to only want to bring you deals that they have 100% conviction on. Um, and I think for, for your benefit, you're really focused on downside protection, which I, go ahead. That's the point, right? It's the point is to come up with a, with a product that's differentiated enough from the rest of the marketplace to draw in, the, to be kind of a, a sharpshooter and draw in transactions that are truly unique, that are uh, not necessarily outliers, but the triples and home runs. And to do business with sponsorship that is better capitalized than the average, has more experience to actually discern that difference, right? If if a sponsor is sending us every deal they're looking at and saying, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? They clearly don't understand that our structure or gap equity program is not for every deal, right? So it's kind of a good way to distinguish also. Yeah, it's not not a volume approach where sponsors are just trying to stack up the deals, build AUM with, you know, pretty, I guess, straightforward equity. So in terms of building that alignment, disincentivizing, you know, the, the singles and doubles, the fee structure, how do you set up the fee structure to also be in line with these goals? Well, you mean the fees we pay to our sponsors? Yes. Okay. Well, I think that you can do less about, right? There's, there's a couple of ways you can, um, achieve your goals. But typically, um, the kind of fees that you see in a transaction are the acquisition fee. Um, for example, um, you know, based on the purchase price of the property. And that usually is between 50 and 100 basis points on the purchase price of the property. You also could see, um, you know, if it's, if it's a vertically integrated sponsor, a combination of property management and asset management fees. So uh, on the acquisition fee side, there's very little you can do, in my opinion, because you're paying them up front. Um, I guess you could subordinate a portion of their acquisition fee and pay them as, as an exit fee if they achieve a certain return. They probably would think of that as no different than part of their promote. So it, it's not commonly used. But one way that we, one thing we've done is um, we look at the total cost of property and asset management below us has a cost to be borne um, below us, not not by us. And so we say, okay, you have a cap. Usually that's between three and a half and 4%, depending on where the property is, the size of the property. Um, and within that cap, your job is to property manage and asset manage. So if you've got some strong relationships with um, regional and national property management companies, you're gonna go to those companies, you're gonna say, hey, I'll pay you 
two and a quarter to two and a half percent. And I'm also going to say that if you overachieve your, if you go beyond the pro forma that you've presented to us, and then I'm going to increase that two and a half, two and three quarters, I'm sorry, two and a quarter to two and three quarters range by 25 to 50 basis points. So um, basically you want to create an incentive for the property manager to want to outperform and pay his people in such a way that they want to outperform. Uh, in the meantime, the sponsor is going to say, but we're also entitled to an asset management fee. Some investors say no. What we say again is, so long as that's encapsulated in the 4% total fee, we're okay as long as we see that you're actually creating an incentivized structure for the property manager to outperform. I've seen that a lot where sponsors could be agnostic to both the property management and asset management fee, but just up to a certain cap, whether that's four or 5%. I think the then, 5% is reserved for uh, tertiary markets or smaller properties where specialty management is required. Because I think when you're dealing with primary and secondary markets where there are lots of regional and national managers, um, there's so much competition for that business. I don't think that you have to go to 5%, but uh, may, maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there are some pockets that I'm not aware of. And in terms of a vertically integrated sponsor, what do you think, does that change this discussion that you just mentioned? And how do you see that they, how do you think they should be incentivizing their, their own firm? So it's one of the challenges of having a vertically. So the institutional mentality is that if you're vertically integrated, you can do a more efficient job of creating value for your investors. My experience tells me that that's not the case. There's no direct correlation between allocation and direct investment, number one. And number two, uh, my challenge with investing with a sponsor that's vertically integrated the property management acumen or, and or the construction, not construction, but the actual construction acumen, is that it's much harder to fire cousin Vinny or, or Aunt Barbara who are in the property management or construction uh, business uh, than it is to terminate a um, regional or national property management company with whom you have a contract that allows you to terminate them without cause within 30 days notice. So, um, you know, 90% of what we do, the property management is not vertically integrated. And we prefer that. It's just much easier to make changes in personnel. These days, if you are using property management infrastructure correctly, it's a loss leader from a profit center perspective. And um, they're effectively um, a um, work, you know, a human resources outsourced HR kind of platform. Um, and it's their job to hire, fire, train, um, and um, uh, support of the staff. And it's our job to direct them. Um, so, and the sponsor's job to direct them. So it's just for us, uh, we find that it's much easier to deal with challenges in uh, human resources. If, if we have someone that is the manager of a particular property that, you know, we just, you know, despite giving feedback and, and, and giving opportunity to fix certain problems, they just don't get addressed. I can fire the property management company or replace them immediately with no excess wear and tear to the relationship. Whereas if it's Aunt Barbara um, and I have to fire Aunt Barbara and bring in a third party property management company, that might put some wear and tear on my relationship with my local partner. That's an interesting uh, perspective that I haven't really fully thought of before. I, I, I wonder, do you have any examples or experiences of where ABC Capital is also ABC <laughs> Management and then eventually ABC Management was fired by either the capital partner or, or someone oh, yeah. else. We've done it. I'm not going to go into names, but absolutely. We, we've had to do it. Um, and it's not a good conversation. It starts with, look, we're having some challenges. We'd like you to focus on this, this, and this. Okay. Um, last week we had a conversation about these challenges. How have you progressed? Oh, you haven't progressed. Okay. Two weeks ago we had the conversation. Oh yeah, you haven't progressed. Okay. A month ago we talked about, okay. All right, um, and then the our partner gets gets a formal notice from our lawyer saying, you know, we're we're letting you know that um, as a result of this, this, and that, we're giving you thirty days notice that we're moving. It's not good, right? Because if you warn the partner, 
and you call them up and you're, you act nicely, you're exposing yourself to potential other risks. But if you play by the book and you just give them a legal notice, how good of a partner are you truly being? So, so it puts everyone in a very uncomfortable position. And like I said, it just adds wear and tear to the relationship, which look in business, there's plenty of wear and tear on stuff anyway. Um, why would you add to that? I, I'm always of the opinion, you know, the, be- the, the better the lubrication and the less friction, um, the better the outcome, right? Just like in a, in a motor. Absolutely. So shifting gears a little bit, uh, one no pun question. Intended. <laughs> <laughs> one, uh, one popular question uh, I think sponsors have are, is when do you want to see deals? Some, some investors don't want to see a deal until it's relatively baked. Other people will say, get me involved as early in the process as possible. The short answer is 24 seven. I want to see deals 24 um, seven. I, I would like to see a transaction when they're in best and final, because I know they're serious. Um, and uh, oftentimes um, the sponsor will ask us to participate in the best and final um, interview uh, with the seller because now they can they know that uh, you know 95 percent or some percentage of all buyers don't have discretionary capital to deploy and so as a result they know that um, there's a risk that the transaction will not be consummated if they pick one of the buyers that doesn't have that discretionary capital, but they're the highest bidder, right? Um, but they want to make sure they want to see the whites of the eyes of the investor. They want to make sure that um, there's somebody real behind them, and when they can bring in their prospective partner on one of those calls, it helps them win the deal. It helps it get everybody more uh, comfortable with what's going on. So, um, it, I'd like you know, ideally, best and final, or a little earlier than that so that we're not spinning our wheels too much. The sponsor isn't spinning their wheels too much, but at the same time, we're doing the right thing by getting there early enough to truly assess the opportunity, uh, not have a truncated process of underwriting. Um, We have two types of diligence that we do. One is called tabletop diligence, where we're effectively um, taking the assumptions given by our sponsor and field testing them by phone, internet, and research we can do from our desktop, right? And based upon that, we can go and issue a term sheet, which is although not completely binding, we've actually never broken a term sheet unless um, something in due diligence has surfaced that um, you know wasn't told to us or you know we found out together that something is wrong, right? So we issue that term sheet, um, and once that term sheet is executed and the deposit is put up, we get into physical diligence where we're actually going to the market, physically looking at the property, physically kicking uh, the tires of the comps, um, and we have legal diligence, um, architectural engineering, physical diligence happening, and market physical diligence happening almost simultaneously, if you will as the lawyers are talking amongst themselves to structure the joint venture agreement and um, uh, get through legal diligence uh, to make sure that uh, everything is lined up for closing. So you talked about due diligence and, you know, when do you want to see the deals? So what type of deals do you actually want to see? Let's dive into the, the markets, the size of the deal, the strategy. Can I just answer and say good ones? I want to see them 24 seven and I want the good ones. Um, so, uh, we, we like I said, value add and ground up development markets. We we focus on the following markets. Doesn't mean we we won't do business in other markets, um, but it does mean, however, that we are focused on. You know, we're going to spend more time in certain markets and invest our time in certain markets. Uh, uh, those markets are Boston down to North Carolina, on the East Coast, Chicago uh, in the Midwest, and then uh, Austin and Dallas in Texas. Um, as well as Denver, Salt Lake, and pretty much the entire Western seaboard. So um, San Diego, LA, San Fran, Portland, Seattle. We're primarily active in the class B middle market space, focused on value add stuff. You know, these are typically uh, 80s, 90s, 2000s vintage properties where there's an opportunity to move rents by 10 to 20% as a result of renovation inside the units and uh, maybe upgrades um, in the, um, uh, you know, the common areas, the amenities, spaces, 
uh, as well as fixing deferred maintenance and potentially re well, we often rebrand as well. Um, so that, that's kind of the wholesome picture of what we're looking for. So in, in terms of a Chicago or a Denver, are you class B infill or more suburban? Um, usually more suburban. I know, I know it's funny you led with Chicago and the last deal we did in Chicago was as infill as you get. Um, 1400 North Lakeshore Drive on the Gold Coast, you know, a high rise, which is rare for us. Um, but nonetheless, um, so typically we're more typically primary and secondary suburb focused um, with direct transportation um, access, um, public transportation like trains, light rail, buses, um, as well as car, right? Uh, and share rides and just, uh, you know, regular. Um, uh, access to good, good access to regular highways, um, to, to, to work centers and, uh, amenities. But, um, we've done better in the primary and secondary suburb space, uh, frankly, than we have historically in the infill locations. The infill locations are more prone to overinvestment and therefore over construction or over building or development. Um, and sometimes, uh, asset classes within multifamily, um, could start competing with one another. So um, a class A project, which was just completed, which technically shouldn't be comp competing with a class B project down the street, starts to compete during lease up. And then generally tenants are confused about the differentiation and management may miss the ball on raising rent in one. And the other one is then hamstrung because they have to compete and their B and A it's kind of difficult. So you get more of that, frankly, in, in, in urban areas and you get over construction in urban areas uh, because for some reason, well, I'll tell you why, but uh, it's because investors tend to believe that the more infill the location, the less the risk. And they stop seeing all the details around them, which become binary risks, you know, over construction. So therefore oversupply, um, or um, we have lots of conversation about rent regulation, California, New York, Chicago, lots of places. And that rent regulation chatter turns sometimes into real policy, which is adverse to long-term preservation of affordable housing, but it's populist. And therefore, it sounds good up front. And so folks tend to go with it, even though they're hurting uh, the prospects for, you know, uh, higher quality availability of um, uh, affordable housing. It's interesting because I think some people think about the suburbs where there's more land and potentially less restrictions in development. And you'd think there's more supply risk in a place like that. But really, you're talking about supply risk and infill locations just due to the economics and the investor demand for such development. So I think that's interesting. Well, remember I said, I, I may have said, I mean, maybe not. One of the key things we look for are high barriers to entry. That doesn't mean, um, some, you know, it's, it's, it's either suburbs or uh, urban infill. It means wherever we are going to go, we want to make sure there are high barriers to entry. So by definition, we, um, we don't invest in places like Houston, right? Low barriers to entry, uh, lots of land and um, very tied to uh, the, the security of one particular sector, energy. And so you've got the confluence of lots of risks. You have um, a correlation of um, um, the places where people work, right, in energy. So that's one sector danger. You've got the correlation of um, general employer diversity. There's just not a whole lot. Um, and then there's an interconnectivity of the employer. So um, if the energy sector goes down, which right now we're in a downturn, clearly, um, there are lots of uh, areas that are going to be adversely affected, such as medical. You know, you're going to have an oversupply of, of medical uh, solutions uh, as a result of uh, some, you know, some of the downturn in the energy sector. Similarly, if you have people in energy moving out, you're going to have a downturn in education, which is another one of their, um, um, another one of their uh, kind of major uh, employers. So it, it's almost like a cascade effect um, uh, on Houston. And you couple that with a relatively low barrier to entry and lots of land availability, 
it's a scary thing because when things are good, everyone's building and they, you know, and so when things don't aren't so good, they're overbuilt and there's oversupply and cap rates expand, rents go down. It's, it's a pretty bad looking thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to, uh, in self-defense, I would say the, the class B and C space is more resilient in Houston and in the class A space, a lot of people are sweating right now, given the, the supply and the demand shock from, from oil. Um, but we have seen historically that the, the affordable you know, workforce housing is, you know, better insulated just via discount to replacement costs and, and other things Whoops. like that. One problem, COVID, because that sector services the very uh, employment um, uh, level that is most adversely impacted by shelter in place. People who work in restaurants, people who work in retail, people who work in hospitality, those are the folks who need that kind of uh, housing, um, workforce housing. They are the workforce. Uh, also labor uh, component of the oil sector. And so when you layer all those in, it's not a good place to be. Um, and I think it will not be a good place to be for a long time. And it's going to take a while to get to the bottom of the market. And only when you get to the bottom of the market can you get to um, opportunities again. And by the way, um, maybe we will start um, looking at things in Houston. I, I just can't you know, fathom doing it at the higher end of a particular cycle. Right. I like we had a discussion last week about the cycle really begins anew when we've hit a pricing floor. And once we've established what that floor is, we can begin you know, that, that new opportunity. Price so, discovery, right? When we have some price, price discovery. Exactly. Which we have uh, very little right now. Yeah. So going into the value add that you mentioned, 10 to 20% rent increases on your website, you have some tra representative transactions where you renovated 10, 20% of the units, and then we're able to, you know, realize a sale much sooner in the business plan via the, implied upside by continuing the renovation program. So, so, yeah, I mean, I think here's, here's the nitty gritty of it. <clears throat> I'm of the opinion, as some people have said in the past, that um, hogs get fat and pigs get slaughtered. So if you go out and you buy a property and you say, my goal is to increase the value of this property by 35%. seems like a reasonable goal when you layer in some cash flow. 35% levered, you're over a 2x. That's a pretty good outcome, no matter how long you hold it for, right? Well, not if you hold it beyond five years, but still. Point is that if I can get that pop in value uh, after month 26 rather than month 46, if I don't take it, I'm taking more risk than I should with my investor's capital. And so sometimes your investment um, hold becomes more truncated. Now, you also have to think about portfolio management as opposed to individual transaction management. And a lot of times when you have investors who invest in individual transactions, they're only asking you to think about transaction management. And in my opinion, that's, there's actually a major disconnect between um, what the right thing to do um, for the investor in the intermediate term, and we are intermediate term investors. <clears throat> so when you have all your investors investing individually in each transaction and there a lot of times they're different investors they may not understand it but <clears throat> they're not getting even when they get certain deals that pop tremendously they're not getting the best service from their manager from their investment manager like ourselves the portfolio management is the more prudent um <clears throat> better risk managed uh i think way to invest capital in multifamily we uh, identify uh, a portfolio of assets. We manage that portfolio to the best of our ability to the best portfolio level outcome as opposed to individual transaction outcome. <clears throat> and there, I think, is when investors get the best risk adjusted returns. Definitely makes a lot of sense. Do you have a, a guideline or general ideas about when is the optimal time to sell? Obviously, what, what you said is you know you need to take chips off the table when appropriate, but do you have a, if you're in a business plan and you had certain rent premium expectations and, and a programmatic renovation, is there a certain uh, sweet spot you think? 
So the first sweet spot is when you achieve the goal of value at exit that you had prognosticated day one. That's the first question you should be asking yourself. The only reason you shouldn't be selling at that moment is if you believe there is in the foreseeable future, a substantial reason to expect a substantially higher sales price. If you think that, you know, it's 50, 50 price to go up or down, you should be selling. If you think there's a 75% probability that you can get, you know, seven, eight, five, 10% higher, that's meaningful, right? Because that to your return is meaningful. And the question is how long does it take you to get there? So that, the timing of that also you should take into account. We have general expectations that we set for our investors when we go in. And if we're exceeding those expectations, we're gonna to wanna to continue doing that, but we sure as heck don't wanna take risk that can get us behind the eight ball, right? We wanna be able to um, risk adjust everything we're looking at properly and time value of money counts. So we've got time to maybe talk a little bit about your co-GP fund and that strategy, which I think is actually pretty different in you know, the skills required to execute the strategy and, and actually what you're looking for. So go over that a little bit more, uh, highlight whatever you want to highlight there. So the investing uh, as a co-GP um, marries two, what, two interesting uh, strategies or two interesting goals that uh, we've always had and they're kind of difficult to marry. And that is one, we're giving capital that is very much needed to our local partners in a parapassu way that they cannot replicate so easily because none of the institutional investors do it. And most investors who do it, um, uh, there's, there's a very finite number of them and um, they're quite difficult to deal with, right? So uh, it's a desired place in the capital stack that sponsors need. The other hand is our investors. I don't know passive investors who can get access to unpromoted deal level levered returns um, in a portfolio of multifamily assets, meaning, you know, 18 plus or minus net IRRs as an expectation as opposed to as, you know, great achievement, right? I, I don't know where you can replicate that um, in the balanced portfolio that we create. And the upside potential is so sizable. It's much higher. So um, um, I think it's a very unique spot to be in. And we do it because it marries the desires of our local partners where, with whom we could be as a result more active in more deals. And with um, you know, a level of achievement for our investors that our investors would find it very difficult to replicate anywhere else. Absolutely. It's, it's the approach for, to generate alpha, um, fee alpha, right? And you're cutting off, cutting down on fees, cutting down the promote, um, which no I promote, think a lot right? of, they, they're paying right. no promote. They're, they are paying a 1% asset management fee and they're reimbursing our direct costs of formation and administration of the fund. So we got to pay an auditor every year to audit the fund. We have to pay, um, a fund administration company every year to administer the fund. Um, you know, we have standard, uh, you know, state compliance statutory requirements we have to pay for, and we got to pay lawyers. <laughs> but outside of that, um, you know, the only thing compensation we're getting there from our investors is 1%. So yeah, it's very streamlined. It's very efficient. Um, and I, I hope investors come to appreciate it. And what I mentioned earlier about it, I think what's unique about the strategy is that your ability to deploy it is really based on your relationships and you know finding gps that are actually you know, interested in giving up meaningful economics on the gp side and, and bring you on as a partner party pursue look um investing in any sector is about relationships um, and it's about differentiating what you have compared to other relationships right so uh, one thing we've been able to do, and we'd like to make sure that we can continue doing it, is uh, as a result of the relationships that myself and my teammates have built over you know, a pretty significant career in multifamily, the first thing that people know about us is that um, we're not 
going to mislead you. We're going to tell you how it is. Sometimes you like that. Sometimes you don't, but you're going to hear an honest response from us. We're not going to waste your time. Um, and we're going to do as we say and say as we do. So that's the first thing that's, I think, essential in maintaining the relationship. But there is no short circuiting the fact that somehow you have to have built the relationship. Somehow you have to have spent the time to um, prove to uh, folks out there that um, you're not going to let them down, that you're going to deliver for them. And then the next part of that is, of course, giving them something that's unique, giving them gap equity, which, you know, very few investors utilize that structure and doing so uh, in a very partnership oriented way, as opposed to a lender kind of way. Um, and then giving them GP co-investment capital to become a more important part of their business long-term. Because if you think about it, the gap equity side, you know, we, even with a prolific sponsor is doing five to 10 deals a year, which is a lot in the private world. Um, if we're, in find one or two of those deals that make sense for gap equity, that's good. Um, but if we're only doing one or two deals a year with someone, how deep is that relationship? Um, if you layer in, um, if you layer in the um, uh, ability to invest GP co-investment capital alongside them in other transactions, all of a sudden, I think you have a much better, um, much deeper relationship and the two work kind of in lockstep or um, complement each other. I like that. Well, Dave, really appreciate you uh, being with us. And why don't you mention where people, if interested in your uh, funds, could reach out and get in touch? Sure. Um, um, either way, if you're uh, either a sponsor who's looking uh, for capital from us or a prospective investor who's looking to potentially invest with us, um, give us a call. Um, you can drop us an email either at uh, info at dvorealestate.com or drop me an email directly at dvalger, D-V-A-L-G-E-R at dvorealestate.com um, or go to our website and get all the information you need, www.dvorealestate.com. Rob, thanks again. It's always a pleasure. Um, great questions and um, I really appreciate uh, your time today.